first of all, um, I would like, uh, I have to announce that uh, uh, the first speaker uh, announced, um, Dr. Um, Victoria Paramayers, uh, my colleague um, from SME, uh, was not able to travel uh, to Japan um, because of uh, her family um, health uh, emergency, medical emergency. Um, so uh, she apologized uh, for um, having to withdraw from uh, the conference. Uh, instead, um, we have uh, two pitch hitters, um, uh, my colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Josh Waldner and uh, um, Professor uh, Diane Newton, um, my two distinguished colleagues. Um, and so they will talk first talk about domestic politics of American security policy, uh, followed by uh, two speakers. Um, uh, the, and the second speaker, so the, the first speaker following um, Josh and Diana uh, is uh, um, Dr. Satoshi Machidori, uh, professor of um, uh, Kyoto University. Um, for, for, the, for the Japanese people, I think that uh, everybody knows uh, uh, Professor Machidori. But uh, uh, for the American side, he is the, uh, the I would say, the best uh, political institutionalist. Uh, and uh, he is one of the leading uh, political scientists on uh, comparative democratic institutions. Uh, he has written numerous books, uh, including um, uh, an award-winning award book, um, specialized in uh, uh, Japanese politics and American politics. Um, so he's going to talk about domestic politics of the uh, U.S.-Japan relationship, especially focusing on Japanese uh, domestic politics. And the third speaker uh, is uh, uh, Dr. Junya Ishino, um, prominent Korea specialist. Um, and uh, we have, I have known of him for a long time, but uh, I think that I, I met him and I talked with him um, in Washington, D.C. for the first time. Um, and uh, so I, I, you can see that his bio uh, from the, uh, the official bio, but my personal um, encounter with uh, Ishino's um, so, you know, in the United States, there are so many uh, Korea specialists, uh, but uh, not many Korea specialists uh, can speak uh, Korean fluently, other than the scholars, the Korean scholars or Korean American scholars. And he got a PhD uh, from uh, Yonsei University, uh, writing the dissertation in Korean. Um, and then uh, he has recently been frequently invited. Um, to uh, Washington DC to discuss uh, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so we were very fortunate to have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nishino uh, today for um, the discussion of the domestic politics of the uh, um, Korea, Japan, um, United States relationship. And the discussant is a uh, um, very good friend of mine, um, Dr. Tomoki Han, professor of Keio University. And uh, he will discuss. Uh, he will discuss and moderate the discussion um, later. Um, he is the China specialist, my my senpai. Um, but uh, I'm actually going to America, right? so uh, I said uh, a few years difference or one difference. I, I do not care. So, uh, but yeah, he's very nice. Very, he's very kind to me. So, <laughs> um, uh, very good friend of mine, um, Dr. Kamo. So uh, please join me for the um, uh, for welcoming uh, the first. Speakers uh, of this panel, uh, Dr. Rogner and Dr. Sweden. Um, so I'll talk briefly about uh, public opinion, national security policy, 
and the, the, the effects on not only the election, but on U.S. Uh, and Japan relations and alternative to like the um, There is a long intellectual history, long debates about the relationship between public opinion and policy, big questions. Like, does the public influence policy or does policy influence public opinion? Which way does it work? And, and big fundamental questions like, is the public rational? Does the American public understand international relations? Do they make intelligent judgments? Or are they mostly focused on local issues? My, my questions are somewhat more narrow. I, I want to know, does the public care about national security policy? How relevant is national security to how the public votes and how it thinks about uh, American politics? And what does that mean for U.S.-Japan relations? Um, the bottom line is that most of the time the American public does not care that much about national security compared with other issues. Sometimes it will get very, very interested, but most of the time national security policy is way down on the list of priorities. Um, the economy is usually the number one issue. Okay? And if you're interested in, in and looking back at the history of this, the, the Gallup polling organization has asked the same question every week or every month for the last 50 years in the United States. And the question is, what do you think is the most important problem facing the country today? The, the, the Gallup started asking this question in 1967 and has asked it every single month. So it's really fun to track a public opinion over that time frame. And it's always economic issues. And so the economic issues go from 40% of the public will say that's the most important, all the way up to the 80s. Right? There are times in which the economy just dominates uh, everything. The foreign policy and national security is almost always much, much lower. Uh, for example, in the latest uh, poll, economic issues were rated as the most important issue facing the country by 38% of the people. National security issues were only 14%. And that includes everything from foreign aid, to counterterrorism, to Russia, to China. So it, it's really not that big a deal. And, and alliance issues are really irrelevant. Uh, probably about 1% of the American public really cares deeply about the day-to-day -day business of alliances. It's just not that salient. Now, that the irony is that alliance politics and foreign policy are incredibly important in Congress and in Washington. You'll see intense debates about uh, how, to, how to treat allies and whether or not to open up new alliances because that decision affects so much about American foreign policy. If you decide to uh, strengthen an existing alliance, that means sending more assets to the ally. That means thinking differently about how you prepare to fight. That means thinking differently about how you trade, who you trade with. So um, in the policy community, it's an intensely interesting an issue with lots of debates, but getting your car and drive 10 minutes out of Washington, D.C., you know, it becomes largely irrelevant. Now, there are exceptions to the rule. There are some times that the, the public will uh, care more than is the norm in two cases. The first case is if there is an attack or some sort of shocking event. Right? Um, and, and when, and when the United States is attacked, Typically, the public will embrace allies, and will go out searching for allies. They'll become very important to them. Um, this is not surprising. When, when you are attacked, you are looking for solidarity. Having others on your side it, it gives you a sense of calm. It makes you feel good. Okay? So, for instance, at the start of, of World War II, the United States embraced Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union, this terrible, murderous, authoritarian guy. Um, because the United States was looking for allies, okay? and, and we'll do that. Um, the other case in which the public cares is after a long period of cost. Okay? So after years and years and years of human cost and financial cost, the public will become less interested in allies. At that point, allies will become sources of frustration, not comfort. So it's interesting to go back and look at the end of the war and American attitudes about uh, Stalin, they had changed dramatically. In 1942, we were referring to him as Uncle Joe. There was great American propaganda about U.S.-Soviet uh, collaborative uh, relations. By the end of the war, it was gone. Uh, the people had 
enough. Um, what are the implications for East Asian security and U.S.-Japan relations? Uh, in terms of the election, as, as I mentioned earlier, there are really stark differences between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump uh, on foreign policy. The foreign policy issue I don't think will have any effect on the election, though. I think that most voters are, are going to vote on issues of race, immigration, and economics, uh, much more than, than differences about how Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump views U.S. alliance relationships in Europe or Asia or anywhere else. Um, that said, however, the debate in Congress will remain very, very hot. The debate in Washington over the future of the alliance will become very, very uh, relevant, relevant. And it would be worth looking at the indirect ways in which this debate is going to play out. So if I, if I was you and I was watching the American Congress, I would look at budget battles, for instance, about uh, weapons procurement. Big ticket weapons items like the F-35 fighter jet are intended to be sold to allies. So look at how those debates play out in Washington if you want some sense about how lawmakers are thinking about the future of American alliances. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague. Thank you, Josh. Um, thank you all very much for being willing to, to let us have two turns at the mic. Um, so if, if uh, my colleague, Josh Rovner, gave you a little bit of a perspective on how the American public sees foreign policy and security issues, I would like to try and spend a little bit of time um, sharing with you how our elected officials face these issues um, from one end of uh, Pennsylvania Avenue to the other, uh, so to speak. If you've been to Washington, D.C., at one end of Pennsylvania Avenue is our Capitol building, um, at the other end is the White House. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit today about the perspective um, of the Congress who's making the laws and the President um, trying to manage the executive branch and get his agenda done um, from the other end. Um, so, one thing that I think we often forget in American politics, um, and it's even come up already a little bit in this election cycle, is that the President of the United States is first and foremost a politician. We talk about acting presidential, Donald Trump has uh, said on the campaign trail that he's going to be presidential when he gets to the White House, he's just not going to be presidential now because he won't win if, he, if he's too presidential. Um, but I think we forget that this person, um, who ultimately becomes the president, is an elected official, is a campaigner at heart, and is looking to win a second term, or if in the case of a second term president, they're looking to position their party in a way so that their presumptive nominee from their, uh, their political party will win the next election. Um, so you have to realize that um, even though they're expected to be sort of above the fray in terms of domestic politics, that's really not um, the way they're thinking as, as an elected official. Um, and they, it requires some nimble juggling um, when it comes to foreign policy and security issues because oftentimes the attention and time spent on foreign policy objectives don't translate very well into the domestic political arena. Um, Sometimes management of foreign policy issues are construed by the media or an opponent as a waste of time or a waste of money. Um, sometimes work on overseas objectives are construed as being, uh, you know, giving away American leverage and giving away American primacy on a certain subject. Um, and if a crisis arises internationally, um, the president will often be chastised by the public um, or the media for not doing enough or for doing too much, you know, underreaching or overreaching um, and underdelivering. Um, and yet, the American president desperately needs to manage bilateral and multilateral relationships. I mean, it's very important to the president and it's very important to the Congress um, to actually get America's work done in the world. Um, and, and I think the president, although 
I'll use the term he for now, um, that may change in the short term, but um, it, although the president, um, once elected and once away from the campaign trail, can see how helpful these alliances um, are, it's something that you know really needs to be accomplished in the most efficient and cost-effective way to leverage um, the U.S. power. Um, and the tension's a little bit of a difficult um, balance for the president. And I'm just going to use as an example the discussion of, which also already came up today, um, the U.S. the tragedy at the U.S. consulate in Benghazi in Libya. Um, if you didn't follow that news, um, the U.S. consulate was attacked. It turned out to be a terror attack, and the ambassador to Libya at the time, along with three other um, men who were protecting him and working in, in that consulate, were killed. It was a real tragedy. Um, but it's an interesting example because at first, the American public, when President Obama came into office, was a little tired of the wars in the Middle East. As we discussed before, there was a little bit of an exhaustion about um, engaging in military action in the Middle East. Um, there was a sense that the Arab Spring and the crackdowns that had occurred um, by the authoritarian regimes were not our problem in the United States. The domestic public felt like enough is enough. Um, we weren't really that enthused about going into Libya. Um, and, you know, we still were recovering from the Great Recession, and, and Congress and the public sort of felt like this is not a good use of our, our time and our money. Um, the president, however, opts to get involved, and he does so by leveraging an alliance. He uses NATO. He goes in with NATO. It's a NATO operation, um, and tries to get involved, but in a limited way. No boots on the ground, but we're going to work with, with NATO. Um, and so, um, you know, he, he, he has that policy objective, and he accomplishes it. Um, after that is accomplished, we set up diplomatic relationships, we open an embassy, a consulate, um, and then there's this horrible terror attack. Suddenly, um, with the death of the ambassador, three other Americans at the consulate, it turns into this huge foreign policy disaster for the president. It's a huge gap, right? The, the administration is quickly accused of not having done enough in Libya, that they didn't have enough security at the consulate, that they didn't recognize that it was a terror attack right away, that they didn't send the right people. Um, and they were really um, taken to task for not spending more time and more money on that particular issue. Um, and so I think that just illustrates the tension that the U.S. president has to deal with when trying to make decisions about foreign policy issues within the electorate and within the public eye. If I shift my view down to the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue and I, I look at the U.S. Congress, um, obviously the U.S. Congress is made up of elected officials as well. Um, we have a bicameral system, as all of you know. Um, U.S. Senators run for election every six years, and U.S. Representatives, Congressmen and Congresswomen, run every two years. So in short, they are never not campaigning. Um, they are basically constantly running for the next race. Um, and then they work in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol, but they really have to live and operate in their districts, where they're from, not different from Japan. Um, and they end up having to try and go home, talk to their constituents, come back to Washington to pass legislation that benefits um, those constituents. And when they go home, they're frequently asked to explain, why did you take this vote? Why did you support this policy? Why did you abstain or refrain from taking this vote? Um, and there's a total disconnect sometimes uh, between the work that needs to get done in Washington and then what the voters expect and want and demand from their elected officials back in the district. Um, in addition, um, there's been quite a lot of gerrymandering um, in the United States, which is a political term of art um, in English, but it you know, really means that there's been a lot of redistricting to um, get similar groups together in different districts. So, while that makes it very easy for, or in theory, it was supposed to make it easy for incumbents to get reelected. In fact, what's happened is that a congressman or a congresswoman or a senator who goes to Washington and works with the other side of the aisle and makes compromise finds that when they go back home to run for reelection, they can't get reelected because they have worked with the enemy. And that has been a really difficult problem for the United States lately. There seems to be this very strong culture of no on Capitol Hill. This sense of, I'm an outsider to Washington, vote for me. I will go there and I won't be changed by them and I won't work with them and I will re assure you that I will protect your interests at all costs. Um, and then the, the, the difficulty is that that's not actually how governing works, right? To, to actually make laws to get things done, you have to work with the people that you're there with. 
Um, and so it, it ends up in this real stagnation. Um, and, and I think the reason it also has become a problem in the United States is that incumbents come back from Washington to run for re-election in their district, and they're not arguing with, if it's a Democrat, they're not arguing with a Republican candidate. They find that they're arguing with a more extreme Democrat candidate in the primary. And same for Republicans. They'll come back, and they will be really battling it out in the primary where they're being targeted from their right flank. It's, it's you know, the, the Republicans are coming back and being um, accused by a more conservative, more extremist right candidate that they're not doing enough when they're there in Washington, and that they've, they've given away too much, and that they've compromised too much. And so um, it's really been an interesting and challenging um, situation for our elected officials. Um, and so it has resulted in a lot of dramatic deadlock on Capitol Hill. And um, I'm sure you've read about it in the news um, quite a bit. Um, so the international issues, um, when you when you faced with a situation like that, um, the international issues that come up on foreign policy and security are very difficult to navigate for these elected uh, officials. Um, you've got wealth disparity in the United States, um, making people want to identify resources spent on foreign policy as resources taken away from those inside in, in need inside the United States, um, and this is been a big theme in the U.S. Uh, election this year, um, both with Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders on the Democratic side, and with Donald Trump and all of the many other candidates on the Republican side. Um, and also, for Congress, for these elected officials, there's very little upside for them in ratifying agreements, international agreements, international treaties, trade agreements, when they know that they're going to have to go home and defend that in their election, in their re-election campaign. Um, and so even non-controversial agreements tend to find themselves in the crosshairs. And trade agreements, for example, have become almost impossible to ratify. And someone like um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who was very adamantly for the TPP, has had in her election campaign to say that she has changed her mind and doesn't support it. Um, and so it's really a very tricky, um, difficult thing. And then with that kind of deadlock in Congress, the president has felt that he needs to do an end run around the legislature, which is very frustrating, right? In our con constitution, specifically, there are three branches that are supposed to work together as checks and balances. And the president has, has felt that he's had to do an end run around the legislative branch to get anything done. And that leaves you with unratified al alliances, which are, by nature, going to be shorter term, less um, official, and, and more difficult to sustain over the long haul. An uh, example I just want to give you, and then I'll end here, about a, a problem on the Hill with an international um, treaty or an international convention that's very important to those of us in the room, is the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, UNCLOS. This is a great example of an international agreement that was spearheaded by United States policymakers, um, but it has languished in the US Congress. Um, the United States is currently in the unenviable position of demanding that China adhere to the rules of the Convention of the Law on the Sea, yet the United States is not acceded to the treaty. Um, and so we won't even be a signatory to a convention that we're expecting to tell China that they really need to live up to. Um, and all sorts of U.S. officials, um, you know, have, have gotten involved in this debate. And in fact, the convention was rewritten in the mid-90s to try and address some of the American concerns that was giving up too much sovereignty. Um, all sorts of officials from Republican and Democratic administrations have gone to the Hill to testify to say that they absolutely believe that acceding to the treaty is in U.S. national interests um, because it establishes clear rights and duties and jurisdictions of maritime states. And thus far, they have completely failed to be able to convince Congress to do that. Um, and as a non-party, therefore, then the United States is in the, as I said, unenviable position of lacking legal standing to challenge the misbehavior of um, other signatories, such as China. Um, and I think that that's a really good example of where domestic politics has held a very good and very important international security objective hostage. Um, a little bit like a game of chicken, um, and I think uh, there's little or no upside for the American people. Um, and it really um, makes me feel like I think it was better when um, uh, we used to be able to say in the United States that U.S. partisan politics stopped at the water's edge, 
and I think uh, many of us wish that were still the case. Thank you.
uh, and implemented the administrative reform in 1998 as a fundamental uh, reform of the central government ministries and agencies' role. Among these so called Hashimoto reforms, the strengthening of the cabinet functions as a central element. As a result of these reforms, the central government of Japan has become shown a clear tendency to take more centralized, majoritarian. A majoritarian government is featured by concentration of powers on, on the prime minister and the cabinet members. Uh, here we find an impressive implication. Yeah, in, uh, decades of power centralization. Um, the, this slide are made from the reports of the Prime Minister doing every day appears on the daily newspapers. It shows that the Prime Minister see poor executives such as the cabinet secret, cabinet members and cabinet bureaucrats much more often than before. It's in the, the political reform the, cap, the Prime Minister um, needs poor cabinet members about 50% and the uh, cabinet bureaucrat 70%, 70%. But today, uh, the well, cabinet members and the, uh, the cabinet bureaucrats, um, the totally 45% of the, uh, the meeting time, the meeting uh, opportunity for five basis. So much more than before today. So, um, it also means the prime minister does not have to see the rank and file members of the government parties and the bureaucrats so often anymore. It means the the rank and file members of the government party, they say only 70% compared with 27% before the uh, reforms. So, and also uh, some other uh, no cabinet bureaucrats, uh, the, the number is that still 50% and 90%, so not so different, but the, uh, the, um, the actually the decreasing the number of the rank and file members is quite impressive. So, um, this is the implied the, uh, the cycle of decision making uh, for Prime Minister becomes quite small. And it also it allows others to take a um, bolder, uh, bolder step towards the policy changes than um, other, forms, other former Prime Ministers, including MEP Prime Ministers. And uh, the same things can be found in another slide. Uh, so, this is a um, uh, this is the number uh, of the uh, data, uh, the, um, the ratio of the executive members and ratio of the non members uh, compared with the, uh, the period, uh, six period of time uh, since the, the late 1970s to today. And the, I don't know, the, the sky blue lines mean the ratio of the non five members and it's decreasing. And the, uh, the the blue lines, the ratio of the, the executive members, and it's a, it's a kind of trend. So, um, so going up um, since the, the compared with the, uh, the late 1970s or early 1980s to today. So uh, it also means that the, the prime minister um, sees much more often with the uh, core executives than the uh, non five members of the uh, government party. It means that concentration of powers and decision making is there. Um, conducted the very small circles of the politicians uh, uh, and the cabinet of ships. And I, um, in addition to the, the structural uh, transformation from institutional reform since the 1990s, um, it is also um, the significant that the Prime Minister Abe himself changes uh, his leadership style uh, from his first uh, tenure in uh, 2006 and to, uh, to 2007, just after the, uh, the poison cabinet. At least two things should be uh, pointed out, point out here. The first thing is the selection of his cabinet members. Abe selected too many of his friends in his first cabinet. Uh, position party the journalists criticized his, administ his first administration as a the friend cabinet in Japanese, or Tomodachi Naiki, so that. Uh, it meant that his first cabinet was overly inexperienced and his members symbolized too much on Abe's ideological agendas, including histor historical revisionist views. Um, compared to his first cabinet, Abe seems to be much more careful uh, in his selection uh, of cabinet members today. 
in particular, he his appoint he appointed uh, Yoshi Yoshihide Suga uh, as a chief cabinet secretary. The chief cabinet secretary is the most significant post of the contemporary Japanese politics and Japanese cabinet because the chief cabinet secretary takes care of central policy agenda with bureaucrats as a as a cabinet secretary and cabinet office. Also, uh, the chief cabinet secretary is required to be a royal agent of the prime minister in policy making process. Suga is not a um, political rival of Abe and integrate his own political fortune to Abe's success as a prime minister. His effort clearly contributes to enhance the power of the prime minister and uh, centralize policy making. The second part is Abe is that Abe focus is more on economic policy on on his own historical revisionist issues. He advocates new sets of economic policy, so-called dynamics, um, just after his second inauguration as a prime minister. He set three arrows to fight actively uh, with economic stagnation. Then he named uh, Haruko Kroda as the governor of the Bank of Japan in 2013. Uh, while it is not proved enough academically, uh, relatively many people believe that the BOJ has played significant roles in his the lost decades, lost two decades of Japanese economy, due to its traditional and conservative monetary policy. Crowder is, Dr. Crowder is known as a supporter of the liberation policy, in which government, in, including the central bank, sets a mild target of inflation and uses policy tools as much as possible to achieve it. While it is questionable whether economics and liberation policy is really effective, other concentration on economic policy with new sets of policy makes may Gordon believe that his and his administration is different not only from his first tenure but also from the DPJ government. So it shows on the, it, uh, in the evaluation of the voter appears on the, uh, the mass report of the NHK. And just at the beginning of his cabinet, the um, approval rate of the other cabinet is really high. It, but it's not um, exceptional. In many uh, actually, actually uh, DPJ government it, it, as well as the cabinet had a very high variation just after its inauguration. But after that, um, you know, the normally the number of approval rate is down, <coughs> downside quite early in, in many uh, cabinets in, in German, recent German politics. However, in the case of Abe, uh, his approval rate is nearly stable and more than 50%. Uh, up until the um, almost one year ago. And just after that, um, the effect of the uh, Security Related Act in last summer and the changes of evaluation and expectation of other makes the situation a little bit change. And today, uh, his support rate is uh, just before uh, 50% and sometimes just before 40%. And, but um, many journalists and the, um, the poor experts believe that um, Below 30 percent uh, must be the um, decisive line for the uh, survival of the cabinet. So, uh, Abe's cabinet still have enough approval rate to have or to maintain uh, their policy lines uh, enough. So, in this sense, based on the good evaluation of his economic policy, Abe can have political resources enough to tackle with other policy areas by his own strong leadership. In the context of the U.S.-Japan relationship, it is significant that the Abe administration policy making depends largely on both as positive expectation and evaluation of dynamics. So and, uh, we need to recognize his cabinet does not give highest priority of foreign policy, even though the Abe himself is interested. And uh, um, while Ripon did his electoral system and administrative organization were aimed to centralize decision making processes in Japan, some other institutional reforms since the 1990s include different purposes the diffusion of the powers. The decision, you know, decision to reform the lower house electoral system uh, to one centered on the um, single member district system was the crucial significance since the the particular electoral system plays a central role um, in majoritarian democracies. The majoritarian democracies um, is characterized by the concentration of power in central government 
sent to give the independence of the institutions such as the central bank, the judiciary, and local governments. However, in the case of Japan, uh, these institutions, uh, such as central bank and the local government, are all to have more autonomous powers uh, as a result of reforms. In other words, a uh, major feature of the, of the years after the 1990s, Japan has been uh, the parallel development of concentrating powers within the central government while reducing uh, the government intervention into other decision making domains. This particular package of reforms, um, which combined the majoritarian reforms within the central government and the granting the greater autonomy to the other decision domains beyond the central government, should be referred as the Japanese style majoritarian system. So this system, a mixture of the centralization and the hidden powers, uh, leads to have more veto freedom in policy making process. Uh, related to the subject of this presentation or this uh, symposium, uh, what is found in the uh, Tema military base in Okinawa, uh, the location issue is a typical case. Although it is understandable that people in Okinawa and their prefectural government continuously oppose the relocate, the main uh, military base is there, um, generally speaking, the local government should not be a bank for education. As a result of having institutional autonomy without enough counterbalancing powers for the central government, Today, Okinawa Prefectural Government seems to regard relocation issues as a symbol of local governance and the other, other, other administration cannot find um, any effective solutions to this problem. So, um, in this presentation I point out a couple of things. The first thing is uh, the U.S. Japan relations have experienced a steady improvement. Uh, since the second administration launched in 2012. Second, um, this improvement is due to active challenges for foreign policy changes by Abe and his cabinet based on institutional transformation since the um, 1990s, as well as personal ones from his cabinet tenure, his first tenure. Since reform that the electoral and administrative systems make the Japanese policy making process more centralized, the Prime Minister can influence um, every significant issues when the Prime Minister uses his or her own power wisely. Abe becomes in, uh, to fulfill this condition in his second cabinet. Uh, however, the um, policy making process of Japan has more veto freedom today as a result of reform for institutional diffusion of power. It should be understood from the, this viewpoint that some significant issues affect US Japan relations like the location of the American basin now. Problems from the multilateral governance are difficult to be solved under the current institutional arrangement. In addition to the last point, uh, US and US Japan relations might have some obstacles in the near future. As I argued about, Abe and his cabinet predominance in policy making process has been due to positive expectations and, and their variations on the new sets of economic policy, so called dynamics, from the voters. Although administration's approval rate has continuously high due to economics since 2012, it becomes gradually lower and recent. Since high approval rate has been uh, one of the most significant political resources for other administrations, um, its dropping means that other administration cannot use enough resources to develop active foreign policy anymore. While Abe does not have, seem to lose his interest in foreign relations due to his personal uh, creed as a politician. Um, political conditions might make his cabinet focus more on domestic issues. If it comes together with a new U.S. president, uh, I don't want the real name anymore here, um, U.S. Japan relations are well experienced another stagnation in the new country. Thank you.
Uh, thank you for all. Uh, great opportunity to, this, uh, to invite this very meaningful conference. Uh, today I will give my presentation on English, uh, so participants from the United States to appreciate me allow to speak in English for my presentation in about 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, today I will give uh, my uh, observation on my Japan and uh, our relations and uh, also agency. そう、<笑><笑> あの、あの、国内政治と安全保障と ま、日韓関係の形成、あるいはま、日米韓関係の形成というものがどういう形で成り立ったのかということについてお話をして、え、そしてま、冷戦後にですね、え、日米韓の関係が、ま、新しい形に発展してきたということについて説明を申し上げ